Good evening. My name is Lily Betancourt Space, and I am the Director of Development at Casa, for Casa Cuba at FIU. I would like to thank you for joining us today for Contemporary, a series of virtual conversations that highlight the influence of Cuban art presented by FIU, Miami Beach, Urban Studios, and Casa Cuba. Before we begin, I would like to tell you a little bit about Casa Cuba, a very special initiative at FIU. Casa Cuba is bringing together scholars, artists, policymakers, business leaders, students, and the community at large to build a leading cultural center and think tank for the discussion of, and study of Cuban affairs and the preservation and celebration of the Cuban heritage. This will be our Cuban home away from home, a home for Cubans, but also for everyone who is curious and passionate about Cuba and the Cuban community. Casa Cuba has attracted influential board members, secured a prominent site on the FIU campus for its state-of-the-art facility, and received significant philanthropic support, including prestigious grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Knight Foundation. Today marks an important milestone for Casa Cuba. Just this morning, we announced that FIU has selected René Gonzalez Architects as the architectural firm that will bring the vision of Casa Cuba to life. Our iconic facility will feature galleries for interactive exhibitions, classrooms where faculty will teach more than 70 courses on Cuba, currently offered at FIU, and a venue for events, artistic performances, and dynamic programming such as the Contemporary Series. Contemporary is just a taste of what you will experience at Casa Cuba. This initiative is envisioned as a series of intimate conversations featuring leading Cuban voices from the art industry, including artists, gallerists, curators, and other visionaries. The conversations are recorded and preserved for posterity as part of Casa Cuba's oral history collection and will inspire us to reflect on the profound intersections between art and the Cuban identity. We are truly privileged to be joined by Cuban collector and gallerist Ramon Cernuda as a, our special guest this evening. Ramon is an internationally recognized expert on Cuban art. He advises private collectors on acquisitions and is frequently consulted on the authenticity of Cuban artworks by major, major international auction houses. In addition to founding his gallery, Cernuda Arte, in October 2000, happy 20th anniversary, Ramon. Ramon has been the publisher of La Gran Encyclopedia Martiana and a founder, founding member and producer of the Encyclopedia de Cuba Publishing Group. Tonight, he treats us to a virtual tour of his gallery. After the virtual tour, chief curator of the Philip and Patricia Frost Art Museum at FIU, Amy Galpin, will join Ramon for a live discussion and question and answer. Amy received an MA in Latin American Studies from San Diego State University and a PhD in Art History from the University of Illinois, Chicago. She specializes in modern and contemporary work from the US and Latin America. Outside of FIU, she has also organized exhibitions for the National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago and the Pasadena Museum of California Art. Thank you, Ramon and Amy. I would also like to thank our friends at CARTA the Miami Beach Urban Studios and our Casa Cuba team for all the hard work behind the scenes to coordinate this program. And thanks to all of you for joining us. I hope to see you at future events and I encourage you to get involved in the historic effort to build our Casa Cuba at FIU. There are many ways to support and to become a founder. We need you to help to make this dream of Casa Cuba a reality. Thank you and enjoy your evening. My name is Ramon Cernuda, and I want to welcome you to our gallery, Cernuda Arte, and to this special exhibition titled Black Art Matters, a group show of 13 Afro-Cuban artists from the modernist and the contemporary period. 
welcome. We will today talk and uh, take a walk around the 100 years of uh, Cuban art from the 1920s to actually 2020. But before we embark in this adventure, let us talk a little bit about the origins of Cuban painting. Cuban painting started around the year 1800. That is, Cuban-born artists who were painting in Cuba for specifically that very limited market that existed in the colony. In 1817, the population of Cuba was about 530,000 people, according to the census of la that year, of which 250,000 were whites and Chinese. They were counted as whites. The rest, over 300,000 people, were of Afro origin. Half of them were free blacks and the other half were slaves. So when the movement of Cuban art begins in the 1800s, the population was about evenly split between blacks and whites. And coincidentally, the artistic and paintings movement that begins in the island precisely around that time is represented by two artists, one white descendant of Spanish people and the other one Afro-Cuban, descendants of African slaves that have been brought to the island. The first artist was Nicolás de la Escalera. Nicolás de la Escalera is an artist that uh, dedicated his career to painting religious subject matter. He uh, mostly worked for the Catholic Church and the pious and devout families of the colony. The other artist in this moment of origins of Cuban painting is a black artist, Vicente Escobar. Vicente Escobar, and here we have three works that represent his body of work, dedicated his career to painting portraits. Vicente Escobar painted the aristocratic families and the families of the government of the colonial power in Cuba. We have uh, a very interesting story about this founder of Cuban paintings, this uh, Afro-Cuban artist. Vicente Escobar was in the early 19th century, the early 1800s, awarded a scholarship to go to Spain, Italy and France, and to finally settle and further his studies in the San Fernando Academy in Madrid. He was such a distinguished artist at that time that the crown of Spain named him Pintor de Cámara, painter of the court of Spain, the only Cuban artist ever to be awarded that incredible recognition in the 19th century, especially being an Afro-Cuban. Um, afterwards, he returned to Cuba and he continued producing excellent work, as you can see from these three important portraits of uh, military people of the island's government. I was telling you about Vicente Escobar and how Queen Maria Cristina in 1827 awards Escobar with this special distinction. It was so important that it changed Escobar's market and it changed his life, really. Vicente Escobar was born black. He was registered in the Book of Pardos, the, libro, uh, the book that uh, was used to register births of people of color. And when he died, he was listed in the death, the book of whites that died. He was the person that was born black in Cuba and died white. This was possible because of the recognition and the prestige that he received from the Spanish crown. For example, let's look at this painting by Vicente Escobar. It's a work from 1828. And it is uh, a painting, a portrait of one of the most successful merchants in Cuba, 
of that period. His name, Agustin de las Heras y Carazo. Uh, he uses the gold to signify the economic uh, power of this uh, person. And he signs, of course, in the dedication and in the back of the work. Uh, we go on into this work, a portrait of one of the captain generals of Cuba, the uh, uh, portrait of Nicolás de May y Romo from 1822. Again, a man of power. It's symbolized by the sword and the cane and the medals. And here we have the vice director of the government in Cuba in those days, the portrait of Don Jose Verdaguer y Carbonell. He was a trusted person of the Spanish court. In 1830, he was sent by the crown to supervise the activities of the local government. Three excellent examples of works by Vicente Escobar. So, as I said, Vicente Escobar was awarded the honor of being a painter of the court. The same recognition that was received by Diego Velázquez 170 years earlier. It placed him in a totally different category from all other colonial artists. It elevated him to the most important artist of Cuba in the 19th century. So now we will start talking about this exhibition properly. The art that was produced in Cuba from the 1920s to the 2020, 100 years, a century of art by modern and contemporary Afro-Cuban artists. These artists brought to Cuba a revolutionary way of doing art. They broke with the traditional styles of the European classic paintings. They broke with the academy in Havana that taught them how to paint in a very conservative way. And they also brought in ideas that were original, that were unique to the country. Some ideas that were revolutionary in social relations, race relations, and uh, the value and importance of the simple people of the island. We will look at the modernism in Cuba and we will start with the number one artist of all times, the Afro-Cuban artist, Wifredo Lam, of which we have a representation of a group of works here, uh, we have these two pastels on paper. We have these two one-of-a-kind ceramics, uh, painted ceramics by the artist. We have three canvases that represent Wifredo Lam in this exhibition. Wifredo Lam was born in 1902 and he died in 1982. He came from a very poor family in Sagua La Grande and the neighbors, when they realized that the child was immensely talented, raised funds to give him the monies to be able to go study in Havana at the San Alejandro Academy, which was then the University of the Arts in Cuba. Lam arrived as a teenager in Havana and studied at San Alejandro. He distinguished himself so much then in 1923, at age 21, he was awarded a scholarship to go study in Spain, in Madrid. And uh, he was assigned to the then director of uh, uh, art and the head curator of the Museo del Prado in Madrid to be his teacher and his mentor. Uh, Mr. Sotomayor was the uh, professor of uh, Wifredo Lam during those early years of uh, continued development as an artist. In 1937, after having produced a very significant body of work in Spain, Lam decided that it was time to leave. The Civil War had become very, very uh, combative 
and uh, he moved to Barcelona first, getting closer to the frontier with France, and later crossed into France in 1938. At that age, Wilfredo Lam went directly to see Pablo Picasso, whom he much admired with a letter of introduction, and Picasso immediately identified the immense talent of Wilfredo Lam, invited him to his home, befriended him, and introduced him to the top artists of the School of Paris. 1938, in Paris, Wilfredo Lam was a success, an instant success. Pablo Picasso introduced Lam to André Breton, the head of the Surrealist movement, to Pierre Loeb, a major gallerist in the, in the city of Paris, and to various other prominent artists, Diego Rivera, Frida Kahlo, and facilitated Lam's connections with the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and specifically its director, Alfred Barr. Wilfredo Lam had jumped into the big leagues. He was already at that moment recognized as a significant modernist artist. And he was the first African descendant artist to be accepted at the highest levels of the international modernist art movement. Lam's mature work was all about Afro-Cuban symbols. It was all about his identity as a person of mixed race. Lam was considered to be and once said to be part Cartesian and part savage. And uh, as for his work, one paragraph, a direct quote from the artist that I think represents his social and ethnic intentions is this. With regards to life Modern painting is a revolutionary activity. We need art in order to transform the world into a more humane place where mankind can live in liberty." End of quote. Wilfredo Lam's sales records at auction in the international arena have broken once and again records and the numbers are going up and up and up. Currently, his auction records is at $9,600,000. Uh, from there, Wilfredo Lam continued to uh, gather immense recognition and success. During the war, he came back to Cuba, and after the war, he returned to Europe, where he did very important work throughout his lifetime, with over 100 museum exhibitions, with over 500 group exhibitions, Wilfredo Lam is certainly the most prominent artist of Cuba of all times. Another Afro-Cuban that wins that distinction. Teodoro Ramos Blanco, virtually forgotten artist. Born in 1902, died in 1972. Teodoro Ramos Blanco was a member of that first generation of Cuban modernist artists. And to be more specific, I want to say that that generation was composed of basically 13 names, 12 men, one woman. So we're talking of a small group of revolutionary artists who brought a different kind of art to the island. In the case of Teodoro Ramos Blanco, his work was about black pride the uh, movement that affirmed the identity of his ethnicity as something that he carried with dignity. You have works by Teodoro Ramos Blanco exhibited in Havana in the late 1920s. He, was, uh, he attended the San Alejandro Academy, he graduated from San Alejandro, and he was sent on a trip with a scholarship to Europe to further his studies. In the early 1930s, Ramos Blanco connected with the Harlem Renaissance movement, and he was the only Cuban artist to exhibit with the Harlem Renaissance artists in New York and Chicago. His works then 
were so, so sought out and appreciated that Nelson Rockefeller and the Rockefeller family acquired works by Ramos Blanco, as well as the Museum of Modern Art New York and the NAACP. Ramos Blanco came back to Cuba in the mid 30s and settled into a position of teaching at the San Alejandro Academy. There are very few of these works that deal with African pride, Afro-Cuban pride, and we here have two examples. We have a Head of a Man by Teodoro Ramos Blanco from 1932, and then we have the woman, uh, sculpture of a woman. These are wooden sculptures, one of a kind wooden sculpture. And now we continue with the second generation of the modernist artists of uh, Afro-Cuba in the early 20th century. The first generation, as I said before, was born towards the end of the 19th century and the very first decade of the 20th century. The second generation are, uh, is composed of artists that were born in the 1910s all the way to the 1920s, the late 1920s. So uh, we have here a very interesting artist. His name is Roberto Diago. He was born in 1920 and he died. He was actually uh, killed in 1955. His short career of 35 years in, of life and only maybe 15 of artistic production is very limited. So it is not easy to see works by this artist, Roberto Diago, also known as Diago the Elder. In the tradition of the Bruegel family, we in Afro-Cuban art have also a family of artists. And we will talk about the grandson of this artist later in this conversation. So Roberto Diago is an artist that again depicts issues of his race and his ethnicity you can clearly see the influence of Pablo Picasso in his body of work, especially in his figurative uh, area of his work. Here we have two excellent examples of the works of Roberto Diago. Uh, the work on this side is Woman, a very important work where you can clearly see influences of Pablo Picasso. And here we have another painting by Roberto Diago, a woman sitting in a sofa. Uber Solis was born in 1923 and she passed in 1974. She was a uh, black woman of uh, limited uh, means. She came from a very poor family. Um, many of the members of her family were house workers and uh, she was a self-taught artist. Uber Solis had uh, the help of Domingo Ravenet, uh, a major artist of the first generation of the Vanguardia movement, who was her mentor. Uber Solis painted uh, works, limited number of which uh, were about the uh, life, everyday life of Afro-Cubans in their daily activities, expressing happiness, joy, uh, a, uh, a freedom to be able to conduct themselves uh, with absolute uh, normality. We have here two works by Uber Solis that are representative of her body of work. These are watercolors. We have uh, a woman uh, tending to a farm, and then we have a farm actually, uh, that uh, is also one of the uh, favorite subject matters of Uber Solis, farm life. Who were exhibited in the Soviet Union in 1946. She also exhibited in Mexico and in the United States and Cuba. Uh, she did develop a body of work that had to do with the carnival scenes and also family life. Um, and she was exhibited at the National Museum in Havana on various occasions. After she passed, her family donated over 100 artworks to the Cuban National Museum. 
Her works are very limited and they're not easy to find. Now we will visit works by another one of the second generation modernist artists in Cuba. This sculpture is the better known and internationally re renowned uh, sculptor of Cuba, Agustin Cárdenas. Agustin Cárdenas was born in 1927 and he passed in 2001. Uh, he went to San Alejandro Academy in Havana from 1943 to 1949. Cárdenas uh, exhibited immediately after graduating with the group of the Eleven. As these younger artists of this second generation were known, many of them worked in the abstract movement of Cuban paintings, and Cárdenas, as a surrealist sculptor, was uh, very distinguished even in those early days. Agustin Cárdenas, in 1955, is awarded a scholarship by the Cuban government to further his studies and uh, push and promote his career in Europe. And he went to Paris. Upon arrival in Paris, he connected almost immediately with André Breton and the Surrealist movement that uh, embraced him. And he exhibited with the Surrealists on many occasions in Paris and in other capitals of Europe. Cárdenas had the good sense of becoming directly related to major galleries in various Europe European capitals. He was working with uh, Bulakia, he was working with La Bussola, he was working with Le Point Cardenal, he was working with major other galleries such as Du Dragon, and those galleries supported his career by providing him the funds that he needed to do uh, sculptures in wood, in marble, and also in bronze. We have here three excellent examples of the Cárdenas production that we will show to you uh, as uh, good representations of his work. So Cárdenas is considered our number one sculpture in Cuban art. Uh, he produced thousands of works in stone, marble, wood, and bronze. And currently his uh, record, sales record at auction, is in the $500,000. He is collected in Europe and the United States of America, Latin America, in top collections throughout the world. Fellow sculptor, Roberto Estopiñán, also from Matanzas, who occasionally exhibited with Cárdenas, was born in 1921 and died in 2015. He lived a very long life. Uh, unfortunately uh, for Estopiñán, the market has not awarded him with the recognition that we feel he deserves. His exquisite draftsmanship, his very careful production of bronzes, uh, marbles, and also works on uh, delicate uh, stones uh, is very well uh, acknowledged, but not rewarded in monetary uh, recognition by the market. Estopiñán was uh, a very old school sculpture, one that would produce one-of-a-kind bronzes and not series. So that is also a thing that we should recognize and uh, applaud uh, for Estopiñán. Here we have two sculptures uh, of the series of the romantic series of female torsos and uh, a drawing of the female torsos also. Another Cuban, Afro-Cuban artist from this second generation of modernists is Guido Ginas. He was born in 1923 and he died in 2005. Guido Ginas was educated in Cuba, mostly self-taught, and joined the group of the Eleven, a group of abstract artists who started exhibiting in Havana in the very early 1950s, clearly influenced by the abstract movement of paintings of the New York School. 
uh, the uh, abstract expressionist movement. Guido Ginas was a very important artist of that movement. And in the 1950s, he was distinguished as one of the top non-figurative artists in Cuba. In the 1960s, he went into exile in Paris, where he lived the rest of his life. His organic abstractions, and especially his black paintings, the gestural qualities of abstract expressionism, with veiled references to the mysteries of Afro-Cuban rituals and the symbolism of the Abaqua coded signs. Totally immersed in his profession, Ginas left us a well-populated oeuvre and a career distinguished by the integrity to his beliefs. Ángel Acosta León, one of my favorite artists. He was born in 1930 and he died in 1964. Actually, he committed suicide. Ángel Acosta León, as a young man, went to the University of Havana and later to San Alejandro Academy, where he graduated from painting, a very distinguished student of his promotion. Uh, in the 1950s, from 57 on, he started exhibiting in Havana. Some of his uh, first shows were presented together with Alfredo Sosa Bravo, his dear friend. In 1959, Acosta León was uh, recognized by art critics as a talent, a major talent of his generation. And after his graduation in San Alejandro, he was awarded a scholarship to go to Paris and further his studies. He left Cuba in 59 to study in Paris and he lived in Paris until 1964. Angela Costa León was recognized as one of the top surrealist artists of Cuban art. In his 34, short life of 34 years, he was uh, received many accolades and awards. In uh, Europe, he exhibited at Galeria Dante, and he also exhibited in Paris. He was supported by Mata, among other uh, mentors that he had. In 1964, Angela Costa León was virtually forced to return to Cuba and on his trip back to the island in a ship, he committed suicide. Nicolás Guillén Landrián, born in 1938, the nephew of the national poet of Cuba, Nicolás Guillén Batista, had a very polyphacetic artistic career. He was both an award filmmaker and a celebrated painter. As a filmmaker, he is known for his experimental and critical documentaries produced during the early years of the Cuban Revolution. In 1968, Nicolasito, as he was formerly called, threw his lot with artists and writers who defied the Castro government by opposing governmental repression and limitations in culture. That year, his film, Cofe Arabiga, produced in Cuba, became a symbol of rebellion. He dared ridicule the figure of the maximum leader, Fidel Castro, on the screen, while the song, The Fool on the Hill, by the Beatles, played in the background. Shortly afterwards, he was expelled from the Cuban Institute of Cinematography. From 1970 to 1989, he was repeatedly, repeatedly jailed, arrested, and institutionalized in mental institutions. As part of the abuse that he was subjected to, he was submitted to eight treatments of electroshock therapy without sedation for his political deviations. Nicolas, other artistic passion was painting. He resorted to the brushes when the cameras were taken away. As a painter, he developed a colorful, tropical, and spontaneous expressionistic style that often searched for and attempted to decipher the meaning of facial expressions 
and absurd scenarios. Interestingly, when Nicolas came into exile, he was interviewed in radio by the very famous journalist, Agustin Tamargo. And as part of that interview, the Afro-Cuban Nicolas Guillén was asked about race relations in Miami and if he felt some rejection because of his race. And he responded, why should I? I am blonde with blue eyes. In 1989, Nicolas arrives to Miami in exile. And shortly after arriving, he displays a major one-person retrospective of his works at the, Na at the Cuban Museum of Miami, which was a major success. He exhibited over 50 paintings and they all went to private collections on opening night. He was an instant success in the Cuban-American community. Belki Sayon, born in 1967, passed away in 1999. She was an anthropological painter and printmaker who dwelled in the anecdotes and the stories of the secret society of the Abaqua, and a society of blacks, some free, other slaves, that was founded in Cuba in the early 19th century. Something very interesting about her work is how she defies that all-male characteristic of the Abaquas by inserting herself, a symbol of herself, in her colographies and other prints. Uh, she uses the color white to identify her presence in her compositions. This society, the Abaqua, was somewhat similar to the Freemasonry founded in Cuba, also in the early 19th century, the Cuban chapters, of course. A rising star in the international contemporary community, Belki Sayon has received many uh, recognitions and uh, won artist exhibitions in her short life and afterwards. Tomás Eson, born in 1963, is one of the most painterly artists of this contemporary movement. Tomás Eson enjoys the pleasure of painting the chalking, the repugnant, the offensive, always denying the viewer the peaceful recreation of and the enjoyment of his art. His images have caused great scandal and controversy in Cuba, from where he was tactfully prodded to leave in 1990. His paintings are grotesque. His creatures are monstrous, bestial, as if humankind had been drained of any goodness. The dark prevails in the extremely talented Afro-Cuban artist who recently was conferred the Cintas Award and is currently exhibiting his first solo museum presentation at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Miami. Juan Roberto Diago, born in 1971 and educated at San Alejandro Academy, the grandson of Roberto Diago, also known as Diago the Younger. He is a painter and sculptor of extraordinary talent whose whole career and artistic creation has been dedicated to depict and denounce the unjust and discriminatory race relations that affect Afro-Cubans, African diaspora descendants, historically and currently in Cuba and in other parts of the world. Racism, poverty, marginalization and abuse are common themes in his art. He has been extended international acclaim and has exhibited his works at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. in 2017, at the Harvard University Ethelbert Cooper Gallery, Massachusetts, and at the Lowe Museum Coral Gables in 2019. Professor Alejandro de la Fuente has recently published the book, Diago, the Pasts of this Afro-Cuban Present a highly recommended reading. 
Juan Roberto Diago is one of the most distinguished younger members of the Cuban, Afro-Cuban modernist movement. Manuel Mendive, born in 1944, is considered by many one of the most important contemporary artists of the Afro-Cuban movement today. He certainly is the only one that has dedicated his career totally to the creation and disclosure of a religious iconography that affirms and explains the spiritual values, mysteries, and sacred rites of Santeria, a body of beliefs that conform the syncretism of the devotional Yoruba peoples masked with Catholic identities essential for the religious survival of the African slaves in the 19th century. What Fra Angelico was to Christianity in the early Renaissance, Mendive has been to Santeria, a religion that is practiced by over 15% of the population in the island. His international recognition is unquestionable. Museum ex exhibit his works all over the Americas, Europe, and Africa. Multiple books, critical essays, and journalistic articles have been written and published. You will find Mendive profusely in YouTube if you so desire. In closing, we want to affirm the importance of Afro-Cubans in the origins and development of Cuban art. We have seen in the 19th century the most prestigious artist to be an Afro-Cuban, Vicente Escobar. We have seen in the 20th century the most recognized international artist being an Afro-Cuban in Wilfredo Lam and the most recognized sculptor of the early modernist movement being an Afro-Cuban in Agustin Cárdenas. And we see strong representations of Afro-Cubans in the modern and contemporary movements, such as Roberto Diago, Juan Roberto Diago, and Manuel Mendive. Cuban art without the contribution of Afro-Cubans would not be what it is today and would not have the recognition that it has today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ramon. That was truly incredible. I see that the comments are already coming in uh, in the chat, just praising that video presentation. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Amy Galpin, and I'm the chief curator at the Frost Art Museum of Florida International University. It is my incredible pleasure uh, to be with you tonight uh, with Ramon Cernuda. And I think you got just a taste uh, from, from that video of Ramon's incredible passion uh, and knowledge um, of, 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 of our art. Thank you, Ramon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we start tonight, um, both Ramon and I, and also our wonderful colleagues at Casa Cuba, wanted to acknowledge the recent passing of Professor Juan Martinez, a longtime professor at Florida International University. He was an incredible scholar and advocate for Cuban art. Uh, he was also an incredibly close personal friend um, of Ramon's, uh, and tonight uh, we honor him. Ramon, uh, in preparation for tonight's program, I actually realized that uh, Professor Martinez had interviewed you for the Smithsonian Archives uh, in 1998. That's yes. Yes. Uh, an incredible thing. Um, and I, I want to also sh share with those people who are joining us that the fact that you were interviewed in 1998 uh, for the Smithsonian Archives is, is also a pretty incredible thing. Um, and it, it speaks to your contribution um, to knowledge of Cuban and Cuban-American art 
um, here uh, in, in, in the US. I, I first wanted to, I mean, you gave us an incredible overview uh, from Vincente Escobar to Diago um, and uh, such depth uh, of knowledge. But um, I know you also wanted to acknowledge that you know, this is a, a portion of a much greater history of, of Afro-Cuban artists uh, from the island. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, of course. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. And yes, Amy, uh, I uh, thank you for uh, dedicating this uh, minute, this moment uh, to my dear friend, Juan Martinez. Uh, he was uh, like a brother. And um, he's gone now. Um, Afro-Cuban art has other, many other important uh, artists, contributors that uh, we could not include in this uh, presentation for many reasons. Uh, one of which is that we do not necessarily have all of the representative works that we would have wanted for, for this uh, exhibition. Uh, but I would like to say that uh, even in the 19th century, you see, after Vicente Escobar became so successful, uh, we had a problem in Cuba. And the problem was that the Spanish authorities decided to exclude blacks from San Alejandro. And uh, they were not allowed to uh, participate in San Alejandro from its uh, foundation in the early uh, 19th century all the way towards the end, till the end of the 19th century. So we had a group of artists who managed to, Afro-Cuban artists who managed to uh, find their way to become significant artists, some of which traveled to Europe to ex expand their knowledge and education, such as Maria Arisa, Emilio Rivero Merlin, Ramon Loy, and others in the 19th century. And then in the early 20th century, we had artists that, uh, like Alberto Peña, Peñita, who died young. Uh, we had a group of very interesting artists who were members of the Grupo Antillano, a group that has been uh, studied in depth uh, by uh, my friend Alejandro de la Fuente, who has published an excellent book on the uh, Grupo Antillano. Uh, names like uh, Rogelio Rodriguez Cubas, uh, Ramon Haiti, Ever Fonseca, and others. And uh, most recently, we've also had in the exile community the contributions of Guy Garcia, Enrique Guy Garcia, mm -hmm. and Aide School, uh, and also Armando Marino, who is an extraordinary contemporary Afro-Cuban artist. Um, so what we've, we've been able to present today is a sampling of the contributions of Afro-Cuban artists. And uh, uh, there's much more to say about that. Well, I think it's incredibly important what you're doing. Uh, recently, there was an initiative sponsored by the Getty called LALA, Latin America, Los Angeles. It was part of the Pacific Standard Time Initiative where more than 60 art institutions in Southern California had the opportunity to create exhibitions around Latin American art. And one of the criticisms was that there was a lack of Afro -Lat Latino, Afro Latin American stories um, in those exhibitions. Um, there were many uh, exhibitions that did present uh, the Afro-Latino um, narrative and include Afro-Latino artists, but too often when we see surveys of art, whether it's Cuban um, or Latin American or here in the U.S., right, we see the lack um, of representation of Black artists. So um, thank you for uh, giving us an opportunity, first of all, I think to see some of our favorites, uh, perhaps uh, with Wilfredo Lam uh, and uh, Augustine Cardenas, but also educating us about artists we might not know. You know, for me, Uber Solis um, is not an artist that, that I'm familiar with. So um, thank you so much for, for sharing um, that with us. 
I want to remind um, those of you that are watching that the chat is open. Um, and so if you have any questions for us, uh, we are, we're, well, for Ramon, <laughs> I'm happy to, to ask them. Um, I, I wanted to go back to Vicente Escobar, uh, where you so wonderfully started um, the video. One of the things, uh, this was, I, I've seen the video now a couple of times, and um, I have to say my heart skips a little beat. It starts in the beginning because it's really exciting to see uh, historic art. You know, we um, are so lucky in Miami that we get to see a lot of contemporary art and a really sophisticated appreciation for contemporary art in our city, but historic art is rare. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, your gallery's sort of commitment um, to also showing art before the vanguards, if I could say, um, like Escobar and others. Yes, well, since uh, we began 20 years ago and before then, when we were just uh, collectors that we also continue to be, we have seen the whole of Cuban art as a continuum uh, that started in the uh, 1800s. Uh, even before, if you look at some of the uh, lithographs that were produced in the uh, 1700s, but uh, as a continuum, it has been a, a process of growth and development. And um, we always include the colonial artists and the early Republic artists in our exhibitions intentionally, even though they're not mostly favored by contemporary art collectors, but uh, we also want to uh, have a point of reference of where this all comes from. Um, uh, it's interesting when we look at the contributions of Afro-Cuban artists and African diaspora artists in the Americas, that uh, art historians tell us that the three most distinguished art movements in Latin America are the uh, movements of art in Mexico uh, and uh, in, uh, in Cuba and Brazil. And it's uh, curious, cu curiously, we see how in these three societies, Mexico, Brazil, and Cuba, we had the contributions of two ethnicities, not only the European presence, but in the case of Mexico, the Mexican Indian presence, and in Brazil and Cuba, the African diaspora contributions. Um, no one disputes that uh, Cuban music is what it is, thanks to the contributions of the African diaspora. And uh, if we look deep into Cuban art, we would recognize that it is also equally the situation with Cuban art. Yeah. We do have a, a question that's popped up uh, in the chat. Uh, one of our uh, viewers is asking about how we conceptualize Afro-Cuban art. Um, they write, should we conceptualize a collection of Afro-Cuban art around the personal background of the artist? Or should we include representations of race, nation, and culture produced by artists deemed to be white? Well, yes, um, the impact and the contributions, the original impact and contributions unquestionably came from African descendant artists. And uh, the struggle to uh, have that contribution accepted was no small thing. Uh, for, uh, for many, many years, even in the colony, there was an attempt to minimize the uh, con even not to even recognize the cultural contributions of the African uh, descendants in the island. And in the early 20th century, the same thing happened. So it was African descendant uh, Cubans who brought up the um, contributions uh, and uh, many of them from a perspective of uh, pride of their ethnicity and of their culture. Um, that is why we have focused on them. We have not uh, wanted to exclude other uh, artists that are not necessarily of African descent, 
in their contributions and the influences of African culture in their uh, body of work. Definitely, definitely. Um, we have another great question, Ramon. You're very, you're very popular. The Q and A is 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 flowing <laughs> after. Um, this is a really interesting question about the market that we've seen. Um, Mendive and Diago um, have some success um, in uh, major auction houses. Uh, Tomas Sanchez, of course. Um, but the viewer asked, um, do you see a moment in where we see a greater uh, expansion of the artists, you know, a Cuban artists at uh, major auction houses? When we see a more, do you see we're moving in a direction where more and more artists uh, from Cuba are going to um, see those, those high values um, at auctions? Yes, I think the quality is there. Uh, for uh, Cuban contemporary art, it's uh, evident that uh, there are artists that are producing great work and they are achieving recognition. Um, for market recognition, um, it would be very favorable if communications were easier between Cuba and the centers of the art market, especially the United States. In the year uh, 2015, we saw that uh, Cuban art was the number one subject of the uh, press in the United States because of the appearance of an opening then. Uh, afterwards, things have changed and that is not the case currently, but still there are very important collections uh, that have incorporated the uh, Cuban artists into contemporary and modern into their fold in the United States and in museums uh, in the United States. Absolutely. Uh, we have a, another wonderful question. Uh, I'm going to hold off on, I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to uh, make sure that I ask more from the audience. Uh, many of the exhibitions of Afro-Cuban artists focus on the representation of Yoruba religion syncretized in Cuba but also a very interesting aspect of their work is related to racial discrimination in Cuba, specifically on the work of contemporary artists like Alexis Esquivel, uh, among others. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about this? Yes, um, that was something that uh, really was uh, for me a discovery through the arts. Um, we had been uh, told that race relations have been resolved in Cuba during the revolution, early revolutionary years. And uh, when we started looking at the uh, contemporary artistic creation of artists like uh, Diago and Mendive and Esquivel and others, we realized that uh, uh, something was going on in the art world. Um, Esson, for example, that uh, these tensions, racial tensions had not really been uh, eliminated and that there was more to investigate. Uh, again, I want to mention Alejandro de la Fuente and the excellent work that he has done um, with the uh, Keloides uh, book and the uh, organization of exhibitions of contemporary Afro-Cuban artists who have expressed these feelings, this tension, this uh, criticism of uh, lack of uh, equality in contemporary Cuban society for the people of, uh, of the uh, Afro-Cuban uh, race. Absolutely. I'm gonna keep asking uh, more, more questions from our wonderful audience. Um, this question is really nice. It's about the connection between uh, literature and Afro-Cuban art. Um, it's coming from a professor, a university professor who's asking, um, I've been proud and impressed by, about the literary contributions of Afro-Cubans. Do you know of any connections between the themes, styles, uh, and more between literature, uh, in, between literature and art in Cuba? Well, in the 1920s, the uh, movement of uh, Black Pride, of Negritude, was a movement that uh, began to present the contributions of Afro-Cubans, not only 
in, in the arts, but also in music, also in literature, Songoro uh, Kosongo, Guillén, and others. Uh, and uh, they worked, they all worked in related. They did, a, it was a joint effort to display the contributions, the cultural contributions of Afro Cubans to natural culture. And then we had the support of some young artists such as Victor Manuel Garcia and Carlos Enriquez, who came up and said, we have to contribute also. This is not only a struggle of the Afro-Cubans, this should be a struggle of us. And they also produced work that came René Portocarrero and others. Uh, the list would be very long because most of the modernists uh, embraced the, uh, the struggle for uh, racial equality in Cuba and in literature also. So yes, it's, it, it was a social cause that had significant uh, support in the cultural um, centers of Cuba. Another question that, that's coming in, um, also related, um, I think, to modernism, is, is thinking about the sense of internationalism that existed uh, amongst so many Cuban artists who were, the uh, viewer is referencing um, how you brought up Madrid, um, and that also uh, many Cuban artists were in Paris. Uh, and here's the question. When did the link to Paris develop? Who led Cuban artists in that direction and why? Um, and now Paris has minimal influence on Cuban art. Uh, what slash who led this refocus away from Paris? That would be a, an excellent uh, question for another talk uh, because uh, Paris uh, and the School of Paris were uh, the uh, attraction, the magnet for the modernists. Of course, Spain was the opportunity to further your uh, knowledge of painting, but uh, the adventure was going to Paris. And the modernists uh, immediately saw that. Uh, uh, they, they made enormous, individually, enormous efforts to be able to pay their way to Paris uh, with Victor Manuel, with Amelia Pelaez, with Carlos Enriquez, with Pogolotti, uh, we're talking uh, Domingo Ravenet. Uh, we can almost mention uh, all of the names, virtually all of the names of the Cuban first generation modernists and their efforts to get to Paris. Um, that spirit of connecting with the uh, School of Paris and with the culture of uh, France continued even throughout the uh, later part of the modernist movement, the generation of uh, Hina Peyon, of uh, Jorge Camacho, of Agustin Cárdenas, Guido Ginás, others that we uh, have uh, mentioned today, uh, who also went to Paris. And uh, some of them lived their whole lives, the rest of their lives in Paris, uh, even after the abstract expressionists and the New York School had taken over the lead in the international contemporary world. So there is, there has been that enormous attraction to European modern and contemporary art. And I think it is a very significant influence. We would have to go back to the early days of the Cuban Republic. One of the debates during the early days of the Cuban Republic was where should this young republic look at for guidance? Should it look to the United States? Should it look to Europe? And there were two schools of thought in, in Havana. And the artists, many of them, until the 1950s, uh, were in the camp of looking to Europe for orientation. Thank you, and uh, thank you as always for your wealth of knowledge. Something that always impresses me is just the rigorous approach to the research of the work 
um, in your collection and at your gallery. And before I ask the next questions, I also just want to say how much I appreciate as a curator. Um, you've been really generous with me. Um, you know, as you know, um, I'm working on a, a project right now and you've just shared so many resources with me and, and so much knowledge and, you know, not, not every gallery owner is like that. So um, I really thank, thank you for being such a, a friend of research um, and knowledge uh, about Cuban art. You mentioned uh, in the video, you talked, of course, about Wilfredo Lam, uh, who is really a beloved artist to many of us who are enthusiastic about Cuban art. Um, another artist that you mentioned that I think there's a lot of an emotional connection to is Manuel Mendive. Uh, and in fact, our, in our chat, we, we have someone uh, very enthusiastically um, asking uh, for just more, oh, if you could elaborate a little bit more um, on, on Mendive. I know you only had a, a little time in the, the video to talk about each artist. Um, and if there was uh, anything more you could share with us, I know you could share, that, that could, there could be a whole talk on Mendive, but um, we'd love to hear a little more from you. Mendive is a religious artist, and uh, we see very few of those in the contemporary world. Uh, he made the decision very early in his life to dedicate his whole life to creating an iconography to the religion of his people, uh, Santeria, which comes from the Yoruba people. And it's basically the religion of the Lukumi uh, simulated so that it, they could practice it within the Catholic uh, uh, reality of colonial Cuba. Uh, I have the highest admiration for Manuel Mendive and the people who follow the work of the gallery know that Mendive is uh, almost always present in our work here at the gallery. Uh, Mendive is an artist that uh, really, he went to bat in baseball terminology with three strikes. Uh, in the uh, early days of his uh, career, the 1960s, he was not accepted by the authorities because of his religious beliefs. Those were the days when religion was considered the opium of the people in Havana. And uh, also he was not uh, supported and sympathized because of his sexual preferences. And uh, finally, he was isolated and marginalized precisely because of his racial composition. So uh, we joke around uh, with some Mediva friends that he's the only batter that has been able to become a very successful home run hitter when he went to bat with three strikes. Um, his work is uh, one that uh, was first recognized and admired in Paris, actually. Uh, a gallery uh, discovered Mendive in the 1970s and began in Paris exhibiting him uh, to the uh, acceptance and recognition of the French uh, market. Uh, in the early days of his uh, international success, he was not allowed to travel. So uh, the first shows were held without him being present. Uh, an extraordinary artist. We could be talking all day about Mendive. Let's leave it for another occasion. Well, I think another thing that's really interesting about Mendive is he also seems to be a favorite amongst, you know, younger, a younger generation of contemporary artists um, who are, you know, not necessarily from Cuba, but who are responding uh, to his forms, both in sculpture and in, and in painting. And um, as a curator, I'm, I'm always pretty fascinated by these quote unquote artists, artists, you know, the, the artists that for whom yes. new generations um, look back to them with such, um, you know, respect. Another great question here um, in the chat, I think pulling on your expertise uh, with through your, your gallery, uh, what's your perspective on investing in building a collection of Afro-Cuban artists? Um, do you see them, you know, reaching the same valuations as other artists? 
Um, and um, is there a ceiling in the art world for Afro-Cuban art? Well, my first recommendation would be not to buy art for investment purposes. Uh, buy art because you love the art. Buy art because you want to bring it to your home. You want to live with it. You want to make it part of your family. And then if you buy art wisely, if you do your uh, homework, if you uh, surround yourself with good advice, uh, if you buy the books, if you read, if you study, you will also find that art can be a great investment vehicle. But do not buy it for that reason, uh, because you're going to be missing out on the most important thing about art, which is its aesthetics, its ideologic, its uh, spirituality, uh, the, in, the exchange that uh, you will get to develop with artists when you look at their work and when you see what the artist is trying to tell you. And you are going to even going to be able to dialogue with them if you have them long enough in your homes and you, you connect with them properly. Uh, with, all, with regards to the market, and I know that uh, in today's world, the market is very important for the arts. Um, I don't see a ceiling. Um, I think that uh, these artists, Afro-Cuban artists, uh, modern and contemporary, were painting from their souls. They were painting from their most intimate and uh, strong, very strong feelings. And uh, that authenticity, that recognition of uh, uh, value that we see in their work is what really uh, achieves in the end the great recognition of the market. Um, collectors and uh, museum curators can see uh, art that is not really coming from those sentiments and those values, and they tend to marginalize it. Um, I think that there's enormous and enormous potential uh, for Afro-Cuban art in the market. Um, we've seen uh, other phenomena that uh, we can point to that um, will uh, serve as examples. Uh, with Fred Lamb being the most successful artist in the market uh, of Cuban art and uh, others. I'm not gonna wanna, I don't wanna mention names because I really don't wanna talk a lot about money today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I, I have one question I wanna ask you, speaking of names, if you could say one name, um, of an artist that you presented today that you'd like to see a major exhibition of at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, who do you think needs to have um, a big send up, a uh, big, big retrospective in, in New York? Without question, Wifredo Lam. Uh, Lam has had in the last few years major exhibitions, uh, retrospectives at the Pompidou in Paris, at the Reina Sofia in Madrid, at the Tate Modern in London. And that major exhibition is long overdue. We feel the Lamb should have a great show at the MoMA or maybe at the Metropolitan. Why not? I, I actually, I love that. Uh, I absolutely love that idea. Uh, Ramon, I, I wanna thank you so much uh, for this evening. Uh, we've all had a wonderful treat with your incredible tour and, and you've been very kind to answer uh, our questions. Uh, I apologize to those of you watching if we didn't get to your your question. I tried to get question. I tried to get to as many of them as as possible. Um, on behalf of Casa Cuba, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Please follow uh, Casa Cuba FIU on social media uh, so you can learn about their upcoming programs. They're really doing an incredible job with with their programming. Um, and please go visit Cernuda Arte uh, in Coral Gables and see the exhibition that Ramon so generously shared with us. Ramon, can people make appointments to come into the gallery? Yes, they can. They can make appointments and they can show up. If uh, we are okay with the numbers of visitors, we will certainly uh, welcome them also.
Well, thank you, Amy. Pleasure. Oh, my pleasure. And I've, I've had the pleasure of seeing the exhibition and it's, it's really not to miss. Um, and of course, we'd love to see you at the Frost Art Museum, frost.fiu.edu as well. And you can make an appointment to visit us. Again, thank you, Ramon. Thank you for watching. And thank you very much, Kapakuba. Good night. Thank you. Good night.